As I ate my big because memories. memories of time. This happened. I created memories. Pillars assembled in a no never-ending pattern. Pictures I took, stickers no I stuck. Welcome to the new era of trouble. The air smelt damp, the atmosphere was humid. The noise of thunder rippled through the city as our feet were submerging in rain. You may be thinking, what on earth is Harris doing in Istanbul in the middle of a thunderstorm during the height of a global pandemic? Well, <laughs> I have a lot of explaining to do. Marvellous morning mugs, my name is Harris and welcome to the largely anticipated travelling through a pandemic. Mr Speaker, UK travellers abroad now face widespread international border restrictions and lockdowns in various countries. But to understand how and why it would be so difficult to travel during a pandemic, we have to go back. All the way back to March 23rd of 2020. The coronavirus, the number of deaths and the number of affected countries climbed outbreak. even higher. The world's announcement of the dawning lockdown would go on to change everything we once knew and loved about travel forever. Welcome to the new era of travel that travel will never be the same. But how on earth did you manage to end up in Turkey? You're still not answering the bloody question. Don't worry, don't worry, we'll get there. After the first lockdown was announced in March, countries began shutting their borders. There will be no possible way of travelling anywhere at all. But unexpectedly, as the first wave died down in June, the borders began to reopen. A series of travel corridors are set to take effect from July... We still had one more chance. But that chance was flattened with the speculations of another deadly wave emerging in August of 2020. Countries began to reclose their borders again, and our chances of catching a flight were now looking slimmer than they had ever been before. But upon doing some research, we found that a few select countries maintained open flight paths for non essential travel. France, Italy, Greece, and Turkey. Because Turkey's health system wasn't overwhelmed in March, it enabled them to remain open. So, after finally finding some lucky flights, we said, hey, let's go to Istanbul. It's not every day you get to travel through a deadly disease. So the memories I'm about to invest in will be timeless. Time is an interesting thing. Occasionally time feels so fast, but that's what we make ourselves think. Here's what I call the memo time hypothesis. The idea that the more memories we create, the more control we have over time. We don't remember days, we remember moments. So with all this in mind, I embark on my journey. August 20th, 2020. As soon as we found tickets, we booked them for the next day. Yup, that's what we do here. We arrived at the airport at 11am to catch our flight from Manchester, England to Istanbul, Turkey, regarding social distancing and protection from Big Rona. <laughs> there was literally none of it. People were literally right next to each other. It's impossible to think that 50,000 deaths have occurred in England. COVID-19 has now topped 50,000. By the time you're watching this, there's probably been a lot more deaths. But to be fair, masks were enforced and there was some sort of social distancing when queuing up. The airport was practically empty as well. And that's the only benefit of being in the midst of a global pandemic. I swear, I swear, if I hear that word pandemic once more. We boarded the plane and headed directly to Istanbul. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are about to begin boarding. Okay, excuse me, boarding group one. I'm in boarding group one, excuse me, I'm in boarding group one. The flight was actually pretty good, not gonna lie. 
We had a row of seats to ourselves, and every other row in the small plane was empty. We had to wear masks though, for the entire flight, so people just slept. I did some work, and yes, that is actually me doing a history essay on a plane. I read a book for a bit. This happened. And in no time, we arrived in the majestic city of Constantinople, nowadays Istanbul. The airport was completely empty. Having strolled through the check-ins at our own leisure, we swiftly collected our luggage. We grabbed the hire car and drove to our hotel. The drive through modern Istanbul is stunning. I've been to Istanbul dozens of times, but that was a good six years ago. So I guess my blurred memory got the better of me. As we drove to the hotel, the moon was almost visible as the sun skipped down from the crisp horizon. The orange haze followed suit. We arrived at the hotel and crashed for a bit. Okay, so you ready for a speedrun of Istanbul's geography? Istanbul, situated in Turkey, is the largest city in Europe and the gateway of two continents. Historically speaking, everything that goes in and out of the Black Sea has to pass through one single city, that being Istanbul. Thus being so important for not only its land routes, but also its water channels. So you just know it's going to be one of the most contested and significant areas in history. There are plenty of geopolitical issues to discuss, which I don't have time for, but just know this one city has globally changed the course of history for centuries, and it still does till this day. Ten PM. I then went out to the famous Blue Mosque, which is at the heart of Istanbul, five minutes away from my hotel. Once again, my shallow memories of Istanbul confused me, but after a while, all the exciting memories came flooding in. I walked around the Great Blue Mosque, but was a little saddened to see it under construction. It's a marvelous piece of Ottoman architecture that still stands after hundreds of years. We had just concluded the evening prayers, and the Ottoman vibes swung in. The way they pray in hymn is, it's a marvellous melody. The old school jumping of the beat, so hypnotic. Anyway, I explored the compound in between the two colossal structures, the Hagia Sophia and the Blue Mosque. Keep those two names in mind, we'll discuss them in a little bit more detail later on. We ate some Mackey D's, which by the way, there was zero social distancing once again. Two meters, pfft, more, more like minus two meters. This guy's literally in my face. I'm quite surprised to see many Brits here. In this one McDonald's, I could count about five or six different languages. English, Turkish, Arabic, French, Hindi, you name it, Mackey has got it. And as I ate my Big Mac, and no, I did not eat a Big Mac. It was a McChicken, actually. I pondered about the history of this culturally rich city. This land was so hard fought for. People put their lives into defending and even conquering this land for centuries. But then, I fast forward to now, where I'm in a McDonald's, the chaviest restaurant you can find, right outside one of the greatest and longest standing structures known to man. A building which bridged continents together, and in a city which was the most sophisticated in defence. It's, it's a pretty odd feeling. It's as if this city has lost its dignity it once had, although it retains a glimpse of its grandeur through the lofty structures that time chooses to leave behind. The city isn't mainly famous for its dishes, its weather, or even its people, but rather the history and the memories which were nested deeply within every single wall and street. These buildings, although made hundreds of years ago, are timeless. Remember the memo time hypothesis I was talking about earlier? The individuals who created these lofty structures whether they be Christian or Muslims, made these memories. And because of their foresight, their recollections and stories have been preserved for generations to witness. Their blood, sweat and tears dried, but their memories are frozen in time for centuries to come. It's truly astounding looking at these ancient structures. How did they still stand? Did they ever just like replace the bricks with new ones? Does that mean it's still counting as the original thing though? All these thoughts and questions whizz around my head as I walk back to the room. Tomorrow, I'd finally get the chance to visit the beautiful Hagia Sophia. Ooh, 
August 21st, 2020. Time is passing on and I haven't even been here for a day. Obviously, Istanbul is steeped in Islamic culture, so for those dum-dums, JK, who don't know, Muslims pray five times a day. In the morning, at midday, once at late afternoon, then at sunset, and finally the fifth one during the night. Essentially, this will help a Muslim sort of like disconnect from their busy lives and bring a sense of calmness. Their lives are often centered around these five prayers. Okay, so I woke up at 4 a.m. and headed to the Eye Sophia to catch the morning prayer, thinking it was at 4.39 a.m., which the timetable had said it was, but it definitely wasn't. <laughs> But, before I go on to explain about that, here's a super quick history of Istanbul and its buildings. So, for those who haven't been to Istanbul, two of its main attractions are the Hagia Sophia, which is a 1,400 year old building, and the Blue Mosque, which was built around 400 years ago, during the Ottoman era. Istanbul was known as Constantinople during the slowly crumbling and unstable Byzantine rulership, until Sultan Mehmet conquered it in 1453, which it now became commonly known as Istanbul, or nowadays, Istanbul. The Byzantines were a continuation of the Roman Empire in the East. The fall of Constantinople is obviously argued to be one of the most significant historical events in history, as it brought an end to the Romans who had ruled for 2,000 years. Already bored? Come on. As for the Hagia Sophia itself, it was constructed in 360 AD during the rulership of the Christians and served as a cathedral. The first Hagia Sophia featured a wooden roof. Now, <laughs> wonder what could go wrong with that one. Then, nobody ever needed to rebuild the structure ever again. There were no revolts of any sorts and everyone lived happily ever after. No, <laughs> no, that did not happen. The structure was burnt to the ground in 404 AD due to Christian political revolutions. It was rebuilt again by another Christian emperor in 415 AD. The roof was built out of wood again. Yep, you would have thought they would have realised from the first time. Then it was burnt again during the Nika revolts. And no, I did not just say the n-word. Then finally, they decided to build a new one. In 537 AD. This time, with a working roof. Good on you lads. Then along came the Ottoman Turks in 1453 AD conquering Istanbul from the Byzantines, who really enjoyed destroying and reconstructing their buildings. The Ottoman Sultan then legally bought the Hagia Sophia and turned it into a place of worship for the Muslims. He purchased it with his own money, vowing to protect the sanctity of the building, and that's the main reason why this gorgeous structure is still intact till this very day. So, the Hagia Sophia now became a house of worship, but this time for the Muslims. Until a man named Mustafa Kemal, aka Ataturk, hundreds of years later, in 1935, thought it would be a good idea to illegally convert the place of worship into a museum, with zero consultations. This was part and parcel of his plan to eradicate religion in Turkey after the Ottoman Empire went oof in 1923. However, 80 years down the line, the newest president of Turkey, Tayyip Erdogan, in August of 2020, reconverted the Hagia Sophia back into a mosque. Museum Hagia Sophia is holding Muslim Friday prayers for the first time in over 80 years. You're probably thinking, Well, that's a bit unfair for the tourists to want to see the interior of the building. Well, my friend, Erdogan converted it back into what it legally and rightfully was, and yet still allowed anyone from any religion to visit the mosque every single day. Oh yeah, with zero charges, which was not possible before the reconversion. It still acts as a museum, and uh, we gotta give credit though to the 75-year-old Ismail Kandemir, who worked all of his life trying to get structures like the Eyes of Fear back into what they legally were meant to be. Anyway, back onto the documentary. Ever since I came nine years ago, I'd longed to visit the Eyes of Fear as a mosque. So, in relation to my excitement, I walk through the streets with earnest joy during the midst of the morning moon. 
As I crossed the courtyard, we entered the ancient palace with our heads lowered. We headed in and saw the worn out paint along the domed roof of the entrance. As I walked into the main mosque, I was in awe. I'll be real with you, I did not expect it to be this glorious. The air smelt fresh, the carpet felt soft, and the lightning was tranquil. This enormous closed air building was not only pleasing on the outside, but it was generously sublime on the inside. I felt like an ant in a bathtub. Yep, yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a weird analogy to be honest. I know, but you feel extremely insignificant in size compared to the vastness of the tall interior. Sultan Mehmet's legacy echoes through the walls as the call to prayer is announced. Gold vibrant lights gleam across the frontal niche. The lighting system is mesmerizing. It places the articulated rich calligraphy on display to remind the worshipper of its rich history. We sat down and waited for the morning prayer. Face masks were compulsory, and we had to pray spaced out in our own little boxes, far away from others. Are a luxury for us introverts. I sat down and couldn't take my eyes off the formidable shapes of the walls. Domes hymned as recitations of the Holy Scripture had commenced before the morning prayer. Here was a recitation from that morning. <laughs> There was silence despite the hundreds of people present. It was genuinely soothing to hear first thing in the morning. Turns out, altogether, I spent two hours at the Isosphere that morning. I could sit here for hours just looking at this one wall. And yes, I know what you're thinking. Surely it can't be that good and stop using fancy words you gotta see in English. To that, I say no. From all the countries I've ever been to, this structure is the most surreal and overwhelming. Not just because of its iconic and brandishing look, but because of the story behind it. And also, you really gotta pay more attention in English class. That was by far the greatest morning experience I have ever had. And to top the morning off, top of the morning, we exited the mosque and were mystified to hear a rapid tapping noise. We stepped outside looking at the congestion near the exit. Everyone just stood there. And lo and behold, it was my old friend, Rain. Rain had suddenly invaded the skies with lightning following suit. We could hear the loud thuds of thunder echo within the eyes of fear. It was like the rain in Hudge all over again. The drainage system from the roof emptied pure rainwater briskly down at the floor below. So I rushed home with ecstatic joy, listening to the noise of thunder which spilled across the sky's canvas. The floor now gleaming beams of water became satisfying to stare at. <laughs> Talk about making memories. Words can't do justice to the mystical feelings that morning. Anyway, I arrived at home after being out for three hours. It's eight o'clock now, so it just took me some while to write all that down. Time to sleep. It's Jumma today. Quick ad break, well kinda. I spent way more than 200 hours on this project, mainly because I had to learn two entire editing softwares, After Effects and Shotcut, and some Audacity all within a space of a month. This is therefore by far the most comprehensive project I've worked on to date. So if my editing and story writing skills have improved in just a space of a month, just imagine how much it can improve in two months or three months or even five months, etc. And so all I ask is that if you enjoy what you see here, consider subscribing. You will not regret it, I promise. It will also help with the algorithm. Also, all the revenue that we get on the channel all goes to charity so on this video i have not made a single penny we stream every week so hop on down and chat with me live i'm looking forward to meeting you three hours later uh -huh, i feel like that narrator from spongebob so today was friday aka jumma muslim's holiest day of the week i woke up at 11 a.m and set off to the main courtyard at 12 30 p.m we intended to pray in the actual eyes of fear but uh, we had no chance because uh, it was ram-packed. Because it was only recently reconverted back into a mosque, it's been uh, attracting thousands around the world, especially now that it's free as well. 
So we shuffled through the unsociably distanced crowd, and as the scorching heat embezzled our ability to see, we finally managed to pray just right outside the complex of the Eyes of Fear. The Imam gave the Friday speech as people listened attentively. We prayed the Friday prayer and hurriedly left the scene to avoid the big rona and also the heat. I do admire the copper's determination to ensure our masks are worn, like pretty much everyone has one, whether or not they wear it is a different story in itself, but hey, 10 out of 10 for effort. I took a stroll near some shops and passed by the trams that screeched up the hill. There are plenty of places to eat here and it's really modern too. We found a restaurant that had an impeccable view of the Bosporus Sea and both of the large domed mosques. Then, this happened. Food was decent, nothing special. We then set off back to the Yaya Zafir as things had calmed down. We stayed there for a while, just admiring the delicate infrastructure during the day. After we finished digesting the imposing spectacle, we strolled down back to the hotel. Also, side note, on December 7th, 2019, I dreamt of being in Istanbul, in the rain, and the funny thing was, I was recording it too with my phone, just like yesterday. Coincidence? I think not. Nah, no, nah, no, yeah, you're right, it's probably, it's probably just a coincidence. August 22nd, 2020. So today on my excursion in Istanbul, I went to the Basilica Sistine, and to give you guys a break from my monotone, mundane, decaying voice, I'll pass this bit on to a good friend of mine. Why won't we? Hello, stinky pinkies. It's your boy, Zidroy Borkmij. The Basilica Cistern is the largest of several hundred ancient cisterns that lie beneath the city of Istanbul. The cistern, located 150 meters southwest of the Eye Sophia, was built in the 6th century during the reign of your mom. Sorry, Emperor Justinian I, the Byzantine Emperor. It basically provided water for different buildings, like my back garden. But today, it is kept with little water, so I can go for a splash splash inside of pools, swim swim, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not too sure about that one, my friend. No, you dumb pleb, it has little water for public access inside the space. The Basilica system was also in a few movies like James Bond and Inferno. The Emperor Constantine built it as a reservoir. 1600 years ago. Very good movies, I do not recommend. Thank you very much, I am going to do some poop. Thank you for that, Zidroy Bokovic. Moving on. It was surreal and mind-boggling seeing pillars assembled in a never-ending pattern. But unfortunately, some of it was closed due to construction. Man, why, why is everything under construction? Once again, zero social distancing. But I managed to lob a T3 sticker on one of the placards. <laughs> Yo, listen, mate, if you're ever in Istanbul, you're gonna have a real field trip finding these stickers, which you'll learn more about as we go along. Anyway, so we caught a boat and took a tour around the Bosporus Sea. The best way to encapsulate a city is either by seeing it from above or seeing it from the sea. Uh, do, do you see what I did there? Seeing it from the sea. Okay, yeah. The views from the boat were momentous and impressive. It's interesting to see how Istanbul looks like from a distance. The boat journey lasted two hours. Dozens of hazed and obscured silhouettes of mosques engraved into the peach distinct sky tower the city's coastline with precedence. The limpid, dazzling sun showered down upon the quivering sapphire sea. The ship docked up and we headed back to the hotel. Oh yeah, before we did that, this happened. On our way back, we visited what the Turks called Mini Hagia Sophia. The architecture is pretty well designed and as you'd expect, it's identical in layout to the Big Don. 
It's extremely clean when it comes to plastering and paint too. Maybe they got away with uh, repainting it seeing as it's not a major attraction. Last time we were here was a good seven years ago, so it was good to be back. My stay in Istanbul is almost over, and I'm really enjoying myself here. But, as I've said before, it's the memories which will last. August 23rd, 2020 So, to keep it nice and sweet, because I'm tired, we went to the Topkapi Palace. Essentially, a palace for the sultans who ruled the Ottoman Empire. About 30 sultans ruled from the Topkapi Palace for nearly four centuries during the Ottoman Empire's 600-year reign. Mehmet the Conqueror, you know, the guy who conquered Istanbul, ordered for the construction of the palace in the late 1450s, several years after actually conquering Constantinople. But now it acts as a museum because the Ottoman Empire went... <laughs> no, I'm not crying, you are. <laughs> Moving on, we set off at 11am to the museum, but I quickly went to the Eyes of Fear because I couldn't get enough of it. And we finally went to the museum. This museum contains relics from both the Ottoman era and also the pre-Ottoman era. Like the Staff of Moses, apparently, or the... The Dish of Abraham, although I think my man's sending a fat lie about that one. I'm not too sure about its credibility. Unfortunately, once again, the bloody thing was under construction. So, uh, yeah, we literally, like, saw half of it. Thanks, Type Erdogan. <laughs> Nevertheless, I really did enjoy viewing objects which were well over 500 years old. Imagine telling someone, Oi mate, you know that cup you're drinking your orange juice from there? Yeah. In 500, in 50, 500, 500 years, and it'll be in a museum for hundreds of thousands of people to see. Okay. On our way back, this happened. And in the hotel, this also happened. <laughs> After the museum, we went to a small area off the coast of Istanbul, under this colossal bridge, this place known as none other than Otokoy. It was calming and sensational watching the waves crash. The new mosque at Otokoy was built too. Last time I was in Istanbul, it was still under construction, but now it's done. Really looks marvellous inside as well. Then, this happened again. And as night fell, we went to the largest mosque in Europe. I, I think, I'm pretty sure it is. This palace literally looked like a mall, a really fancy one. It's got car parking, a cafe, a gift shop, vending machines, air conditioning, fully heated jacuzzi. Okay, mm, maybe not the last one. But it had all sorts. The golden tint from the lights that shine on the exterior of the mosque brings the mosque to life during the night. So we parked in the parking lot, duh, and I headed up to recall the call to prayer. But obviously, knowing my luck so far, that didn't happen. I walked up and recorded a little bit of the call to prayer. <laughs> but my phone stupidly died. And then, that was me, clumsily waving around my dead phone in my hand. Pretty salty about that one. Enough of me wandering on. The mosque from the inside was extraordinarily capacious. Its wide marble pillars stand firm around the four corners. The chandeliers glisten and flicker over the intricate patterned carpets. The noise of thundering stumps of children boom through the walls, leaving an echoing effect. The gold finish along the giant walls and pulpits are a unique and delicate finish to the already expansive interior. So we finished praying and we went home. 
that was it. It's our last day today. Also, I wanted to see Durga's axe, but it was closed. I guess Turkey just wants to renovate everything now, it's a pandemic. August 24th, 2020, 4 a.m. 4 a.m. Mughead time. It's 3 a.m. I'm a goddamn Mughead, Mason. Time was ticking. My final day in Istanbul. Okay, I woke up early at 4 a.m. and set off to the eyes of here two hours before so I could get in for the morning prayer. I prayed in the second row, pretty much the first, so it was cool being right up close to the Imam's booming voice. I had one more quick glance at it all in silent protest as I sadly shuffled my way backwards through to the exit. That unfortunately was my last visit to the Eye Sophia. I arrived back at the room by 7am and went to sleep till about 10am. I then set off to the Eye Sophia at noon. Then when this happened. Yeah, I gotta stop doing these. I then recorded the call to prayer outside. <laughs> then to end this magical journey off, we prayed Dhuhr, which is also known as the noon prayer, at the Blue Mosque. We started this magical journey off at the Blue Mosque and ended it at the Blue Mosque. The city of a thousand tales and legends was gradually awaiting my departure. This was a remarkable journey, and it had come at the strangest of times. It had come at the end of the first wave. To stay here and save lives. It was finally time to leave. But the journey never ends. Although my trip to this historical site comes to a halt, a new story of a new traveller emerges. That story and those memories are now yours to tell. Whether you be visiting your Nana's backyard for the summer or reaching the heights of the world, remember, you'll never know the value of a memory until it becomes a memory. Along my trip, I created memories through the people I spoke to, pictures I took, stickers I stuck, the food I ate, the structures I looked at, and most importantly, you guys. Without this platform, my memories would be nigh impossible to visualize. And, just like the towering palaces of Istanbul, which memories cling to and time leaves behind, my memories of traveling through global darkness will always live on. Whoa, 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 wait, you think that was it, huh? We caught a plane to Dalaman, which is somewhere around there. This happened. And with all that silliness out of the way, it was good stuff. See ya, and long live the tomatis. To roll them credits. The coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades. And this country is not alone. All over the world, we're seeing the devastating impact of this invisible. This weekend is going to be very different. You'll have to stay home. You'll have to Skype that big family dinner. And you will beat the coronavirus, and we will beat it together. Thank you.